struggle Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past Bound up in shackles of all my failures This prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight. It's already been won. And I am redeemed. You set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains. thousand it was a big huge disagreement in America first of all we started out in uh, 2019 with a very tumultuous election values that were going to change the whole dynamics of America and where America was headed. And, and, and so what ended up happening was we got struck with the pandemic, but right before that we had the election and there was a lot of people that didn't like the results, both sides, okay? So 
And coming up through that, we come into the summer of 2020. Or no, I'm sorry, 2020 was when the election was. And then we come in to there with the election. We're, we're, we're stuck um, into some things starting to happen. We found out about a pandemic, uh, about coronavirus and all of that. Now everybody's got to stay in their houses. You can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. And then all of a sudden, there starts a thing by the name of uh, George Floyd with a, uh, today it is not unusual, everybody has their cameras. And a lot of times what occurs is people are getting beat up, shot at, and people are no longer helping them, but rather recording it. Well, that happened with the case in Minnesota with George Floyd. And so what ended up happening was that started a summer of riots. We ended up with roughly 574 riots. A nation just torn apart. People who had businesses, their house, their businesses were destroyed, burned up, or looted. While police officers watched why? Because they were afraid. If they did anything, they were going to be sued or called a racist or this or that. And so what happened was we became more diverse. We, we became so much more divided. And today we're more and more divided. And what's happened is in the church, we've become divided in, in ways that we haven't realized. In some of it is, for instance, do I go to church or do I not go to church? You know, they're telling me that the coronavirus is still here. It is. It always will be. It's not going away. It's been here for a long other times. We call it SARS. Now we call it this or we call it that. And, and, and we come up with vaccines. We put on masks. We do this. We isolate all of the things in here, the rules change from week to week or whatever. Sometimes we'll let it down and sometimes we'll do not. And so what's happened is the church has lost its power to really reach the people that God has got us to do. This isn't just this church. I've talked to multitudes of people whose churches have lost attendance. And you could say, oh, that's only little churches. Go talk to Joel Osteen and see how much his attendance has gone down. Go out and, and, and talk to Rick Warren out, out at Saddleback. Go into all of the other churches. It doesn't matter what denomination or what faith. People are, are losing that. And, and people are hurting, as you've seen. These ladies have been redeemed. And God has set them free. And so, so many times what happens in a lot of churches, when a drug addict walks into their church, I'm sorry, you're not welcome here because of this or that. And my question then becomes this, doesn't God say sin is sin? And when we get saved, he gives us forgiveness and the penalty for that sin is now erased. So instead of death, now I have life. Does that mean I'll be perfect? No. Will I still sin? Yes. But I got to come down here to sin so I don't sin in the pulpit, right? Because that makes it a lesser sin if I did sin there than I do here. And it isn't. We have no right whatsoever to judge other people per se. And the only right that I know that's given up to us in the Bible of judging people is found from Jesus himself. And that is to look at your lives. I can look at your lives, and from there, you may tell me that you're a Christian, but I don't see any love at all. And when I don't see any love, I have every right to judge you as such because the number one gift that God gives to each and every one of us is not 
a, a, a disagreement about, well, well, is it teaching or is it this or is it that? The number one love that everybody gets is, or the number one gift is love, just flat out. Which means what? When I see somebody walking, I don't walk to the other side, I love them. That's what Jesus did. I, I, I think we were talking. Uh, we showed, them, we showed a, a video of where we had seen Jesus at the sound, uh, Sight and Sound Theater. And it shows him and his, his apostles and everybody running because here came a leper. And the, and the rule of, of that time in, in their traditions was when someone was a leper, they had to call out unclean. They were not allowed to go into the temple. They weren't allowed to worship. They had to stay isolated away from everybody else. And Jesus pushes his disciples back and goes and hugs the guy and heals him. And, and in, the, in the thing that sometimes you don't even think about, it shows Jesus coming up to his disciples and it shows them backing away from Jesus. You, see, you just touched someone unclean. I think you got cooties. You know, Jesus love your teaching, but can you teach us over there and we'll sit here. But yet you find out they don't, they all get back together. Why? Because the guy is totally healed. He doesn't have to go around anymore hollering, unclean, unclean. Now, the very first thing you find these people doing is going to the temple to worship. Why is it that most sinners, the first thing they want to do is go to the temple to worship when Christians, I don't know if I really want to go today. You know? Um, I got, you know, that's not, my, that's not my number one priority. So this morning, uh, let's start with Deuteronomy chapter 31 and verse 12 and 13. And so the, the scriptures are up here. Look what he says. He says, gather the people, not just a person. Gather the people, men, women, dependents, or children, the resident aliens, even the aliens. Hmm, there really is aliens, the Bible says so. <laughs> and a lot of people think that we as Christians are aliens, you know? But the resident alien within your city gates so that they may listen and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to follow all the words of this law. And what's happened a lot of times is when we look at the words that they get translated to, we begin to interpret the message based upon our understanding of the word. And when you say fear, this is what a lot of people who come into church, the very first thing you say, well, you got to learn to fear the Lord. And what they think is you've got to be afraid of him. And there's nothing for him to be afraid of. Fear means to honor his awesomeness, his position, the things that he gives to us that we don't deserve. So what's he telling? He's telling them to do this. Why? Then your children who do not lo know the law will listen and learn to fear the Lord your God. As long as you live in the land that you are crossing, the Jordan to possess. God, ladies and gentlemen, we don't realize that we are just like the children of Israel. This is not our home. We right now are in bondage and slavery to the government. This is why some people don't understand. They just think that the decision that was made Friday on Roe versus Wade was all about abortion. It did not, it did not, did not, say you could not get an abortion. What it said was, it is up to the people to decide this, not some elected official over here sitting in, 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 in Washington, D.C., who has to raise up all kinds of money to get certain seats and certain powers and position. The, our nation was never created for the government to tell us everything that we are supposed to do. It was built upon the principles and the basic principles of God-given rights. That it doesn't matter how 
rich or how poor. Doesn't matter whether you're doing drugs or not. It doesn't matter whether you're a thief or whatever. You, every one of us have God-given rights until we give them up. And so what's he saying? He's saying, parents, the very first thing, train up your child in the way that they should go so that when they are old, they will not depart. That doesn't mean that they won't get in trouble. But something will come into their thoughts and their minds that will remind them of what they were taught when they were little. Because God hasn't given up on you. He doesn't. There are people still praying. Hey, let us share Jesus with you. And what's happening right now? When we don't understand the power of gathering. I understand that God says, if there's only three of you, then I'm going to be there. I understand that. But let me ask you this question. How many baseball games did you watch, or football games, or basketball games, did you watch during the pandemic? They were still showing them, and after a while they still played. But they were playing to stadiums, arenas, ball diamonds and everything that were totally empty. And the first thing that you would ask the players on the field, what do you miss the most in this pandemic? And they will tell you the people in the stands that are cheering us on. Yes, we know the art of playing baseball or basketball or football, but it's better when you're standing up there in baseball, getting ready to hit, and the pitcher throws the ball, and there's a roar of people who are rooting for the home team, and they're rooting for you, and you can swing better. And they'll tell you it excites your game more. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what he's talking about in the power of gathering. When it's three or four people, yes, the power of God is there. Yes, the Holy Spirit is there. Yes, Jesus is there. And yes, we are. But the problem is we're not seeing the tremendous power that it has when there's 50,000 people gathered in relationship to five people gathered. And we've forgotten about those things. And he told them, he says, hey, Go out and bring everybody in and tell them about me. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 through verse 27. Look at what he says. And let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. It is very hard and, and, and I share all the time. It is very hard for somebody who's watching online to show me that they love me. It's very hard for someone online if I stand here and tell you that I'm hurting. Because what will they do? Okay, they write a little note that says, I'm praying for you. I hope everything else gets better. But every once in a while, we need a hug. We need a touch. Because sometimes we don't understand that God is touching us through other people. They're they're provoking us. They're basically giving us more desire to go serve. And he says, not neglecting. Look at this. Not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit to do but encouraging each other. If you've ever run track, I did in in, 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 um, in junior high back then, ninth grade was junior high, you didn't go to the big kid school yet. You you were stuck in the middle, you know? So So you were there. When you're out there and you're running and there's nobody there to cheer you on, You're encouraging yourself. And there are sometimes you're hurt. And you need somebody to just keep pushing you, like I'm sure your ladies do. There are days that you'll get up and just feel like this is not worth it. I could go back over here and I could do this and do that and and just fall back into that old state. 
But every once in a while, I need somebody to push. That's the same thing in our Christian life. Every once in a while, I need to push. You can't push me if you ain't with me. Because in reality, I understand I have God. I understand I have Jesus. I understand I have the Holy Spirit. But every once in a while, I need some flesh to understand I'm in this with you. I know Jesus is in this with me. But I need to see something here. And people say, well, you can see Jesus. I can see, I can see the effects of Jesus. And sometimes we need that encouragement, which God gives us through other people. But look at what he says. Uh, again, as we, and he says, even more so as we see the day approaching. I can't, I, I'm not a prophet that can tell you the exact day and time that Jesus is coming back. As a matter of fact, if I run into someone who tells me that they know the exact time and death, I, I'm, I'm gonna say, you must be God. Because what Jesus said is that no man knoweth the day nor the hour, not even me. I don't even know it. All I know is I'm going back to intercede for you and I'm there waiting for more and more to come but I'm also listening to the voice of my father. And when my father says, hey, son, go get your bride, honey, he ain't waiting around. He's coming. I know everybody thinks we're going to sneak out of here. I'm sorry. I have a very serious problem with that. Because I think that when Jesus comes, and, and I believe in the rapture, and when it occurs, we ain't going out. Well, hey, see you guys. Nice meeting you. You know, it's, it's been a good life, good ride. I'm sorry. Because when I look up and hear the voice of God or of Jesus saying, come on home. Honey, we are Lazarus. Coming out of the grave unloosed not bound by anything anymore and I don't think that Lazarus just kind of strolled out of the grave pardon my stupidity but I think he whoa yes 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 good Jesus yes I haven't seen you in so long I still remember the first time you called me out of the grave and what happened I had to go back again. I would really like to discuss that with you, Jesus. But it's okay. I understand why you did it. And sometimes we don't understand that he is excited. Why? Because he has been building his bride's house and waiting for the time when his father says, go grab her, bring her home. And what's gonna happen? The church that has been gathering in different places, in different spots, I don't care what language you speak, when we get to heaven, there's gonna be one language. And God's gonna be the interpreter and guess what? It's all going to be holy. No matter where we come from, no matter what we do, we're gathering. And may I say this to you all? We are going to have a worship service that is out of this world. And the best part about it is it's not going to be constrained by time. Do you ever think about it? How much... How much are you going to praise God in heaven? Well, let's give him about 15 minutes. That's what we've got on the time slot. You, you know, uh, we've got this thing planned out. I've got 15 minutes for uh, praise and worship. Uh, God, you've got about 30 minutes for sermon. And then we've got to go figure out where, what place is open to go eat. And oh, by the way, we've got to get out by 12. 
you, you know, and all of those things. But we need to understand that what happens is there is power in the people gathering together because we miss each other and we miss that power. The other thing that we need to see is in Ephesians chapter four, verses 16 and 17. We got it? Okay. From him, the whole body, the whole body fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for building up itself and, and love by the proper working of each individual part. Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord, you should no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their thoughts. I think there's a scripture in the Bible that says every one of us are a member of the body of Christ, okay? We may disagree with theology and doctrine, but if we're a child of God, there's one thing that we've got to understand, and that is this. Not everybody is a foot, not everybody is an eye, not everybody is a bone, not everybody's a ligament, but we all are one part of that body. And so I hear people all the time say, I'm a Christian, but I don't need to go to church. And I keep saying, show me that. Show me that. Well, I've got, I've got God, and that's all I need. Then you're telling me that God's a liar. Because God had Adam, the creation of all creation. He was absolutely perfect. There was nothing wrong with Adam, nothing wrong with creation. God loved that relationship. Every day, he would come down and he would talk to Adam. He would walk. Now, how, how long would God walk? I have no clue, but I know that it was every day. So it wasn't 24 hours, okay? I know that much because Adam had to sleep. God didn't. So let's give him the benefit of the doubt from sunrise to sunset for 12 hours. God was awesome with this relationship. But he looked at Adam and he says, there's something missing here. I've got a great relationship with Adam, but when I'm gone, Adam doesn't have anybody. He's got the trees, he's got all of my creation, but he's still lonely. He's still missing. And he said, so what will I do? I will create with for him a helpmeet, someone to come alongside of him, to walk with him, to be with him, to help support each other. And he did. And so what I say is I'm sorry, but in that I see us walking together as partners in this journey together. Not one behind and one in front. We're walking along together in this big chain held together by Jesus. It is the, it is the longest stretching out of the arms that you could ever see and all holding up each other. And so when we I hear people say, I don't need to go, I'm fine, and all this. I'm saying, you don't read the scripture. You don't understand. God says you're not fine. You need to be with others. Because when you're with others, there is this power in prayer that when a lost person walks into your midst and the message, the word is delivered, then there is power and strength that basically takes care of Satan was sharing with some people this week. Do you understand there is only one that I know that has had perfect attendance in, in church? Satan. Because there's some churches God is not in. They play the game. And there may not be one saved soul in that what they call church. 
And you say, well, you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, I believe there's a church of Satan that is actually a recognized church. And you think God's in that one? He's not invited. So let me ask you this question. Then why are we inviting Satan in? We shouldn't. As a matter of fact, I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times that what I really like to do is sit out in the parking lot and tell Satan, I understand you're gonna come after me. I understand you wanna do all those things. But hang on a while, I'm, I gotta go in here with God and you're not welcome in here. But a lot of times people will bring Satan with them to church and they may be Christians. How do you know? I've been that person. Got up in the morning, fought with the wife, kids won't get dressed, everything's going wrong and you come into the pulpit and your attitude stinks. And everybody says, what are you so mad about this morning? Well, my wife didn't do this. My kids wouldn't listen to me. This happened to me. That happened to me. And I'm just tired. And Satan says, yeah, preach it, brother. <laughs> there ain't nobody going to come back to this stuff. And he accomplished exactly what he wanted to do. And that's why we need to understand that we've got to do the things that God wants to do. And, and we're not autonomous. We are people. We need to be together. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 22. And we'll finish these things. You don't have that one? Okay, let me grab it real quick. This is what happens when you don't put everything up there. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Look at what he says. He says to us this. So then you are no longer foreigners or, and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household. Built on the foundation, he says, of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together. Not being built separately, but you are being built built together for God's dwelling in the spirit. I look at it like this. God dwells in the temple. And they learned that. So we're in the temple. So what's God doing? Well, first of all, he's building a building. Jesus is the cornerstone. That's the support that's going to hold it all up. The foundation Basically, you understand, it is the teaching of the apostles and all of this stuff that Jesus had taught them to do. So they're going out there, reaching people all over. So Jesus is the cornerstone to make sure everything is straight, plumb, it's going to stand forever. But here's the thing. Every one of us are bricks in this building. And he's building into us something that's going to hold forever. It's not gonna deteriorate over time. It's gonna be there. And so what we need to understand is this, and we talked about it kind of yesterday. We are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven. And a citizen basically carries the principles of their nation. Like we say we're an American. Okay, so what do you stand for? I don't know, I'm an American. No, you've got to have some principles, no matter who you are. There, there are some will be from Iran, Iraq, their principles may be different. There are, in America, we, we say we have one husband, one wife. You've got other civilizations that have multitudes of wives. That's their principles. But what we understand is that we talk about our body is the temple of the Lord, where the Lord dwells. And you put all of these bodies together and we all become part of this embassy of God. We all become part of the bride of Jesus. And then so what happens is this. Every one of us are a building block in this that Christ is building. 
we're all talking about, and, and, and I, I understand this, we all talk about, I can't wait till I get to heaven to see my mansion that he's built. I, I don't want to sound sacrilegious, but what if he's building you an outhouse? You don't understand, I don't want an outhouse. I want a mansion. Well, what if he built the most exquisite outhouse there ever was? Can I tell you something? It doesn't really matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter how big or how little. Every one of us aren't gonna go down the street and say, I got 12 rooms. How many you got? Well, I wasn't too good. I got one. You know, my living room, my bedroom, everything's all together. You know, it's just an efficiency. No, I'm sorry. I don't know exactly how much time we're going to spend there. I, I, I'm sorry. There, there is no night, so we don't have to go to sleep. I don't have to cook because God's got everything for us to eat. As a matter of fact, I think it was Jesus that prepared the meal for his, for his disciples after he arose. And they saw him there. He, he did the cooking. And may I say to you, he would be the master chef. You wouldn't even have to vote on it. He, he's got the best prepared. And so sometimes we don't understand these things. Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, and I'm almost done. I'll get you out of here by one, I promise. So if I get you out here one minute before, we're cool. But our citizenship is where? Our citizenship is in heaven, he says, okay? And we, are, and we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition, condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. So then, my dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy and crown in this manner stands firm in the Lord, dear friends. So what's he saying? He's saying, don't you understand that all of the things that is, is being done, our citizenship isn't here. Our citizenship is in heaven. So what values should I be displaying? I should be displaying my values of heaven. But so many times what happens is I'm a citizen of America and I'm living in the present, present time. So I'm taking on the values of America instead of where is my final home and taking on the citizenship of heaven, not earth. Jesus said this. He says, if the laws of the land, he says, you give the honor unto Caesar, that which is Caesar, God, that which is God. But if they make a law that is in direct violation of God's law, you have every right, and I expect you to exercise that right to not do that law. And if you are punished and put in jail, I'll be there. If you're punished and you, go, and you die, Hey, praise the Lord. I got out of here. You say you're crazy. Hold on a minute. Let's see. He had 12 disciples or apostles. Um, Judas went and hung himself. They brought on um, a, his replacement. Yeah, that they, well, they said Matthias, but, and, and God says, no, that's not really the one I want. So he brought along Paul to, to do that. And, and if I read my Bible right, every one of them were killed except for John. And even John was put in prison on the Isle of Patmos. So did they all give up? No, they stood strong. Their citizenship was in heaven not here. And so my question to you is this. 
do I have to go along with the laws? No. If they're in direct violation with God, no. Why? Because I'm an ambassador for God. I'm ambassador for where my citizenship lies. And so are you. Every one of us are ambassadors for that time and that place. So the question arises is this. The gospel of Jesus Christ is, is one thing. It's not about being alone anymore. Do you understand that actually when you're out here in the world, you think you've got friends? Where are they when you get into trouble? Where's our families? Some of you experience that more than others. Where you depended upon your family. And they didn't like your choices, so they abandoned you. And so, in sin, we're alone. But in Christ, we're not alone anymore. Because we're all part of this big family that says, I love you no matter what. Do I like your decisions? No. But your decisions doesn't make my love. You see, I show you how much I love you 